Uh, I got here uh, late last night. Okay. Yeah. So only in the south is how you drove here. That's right. right. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Of course, there's like the <laughs> Bay Area like fog delay. Like I knew this flight was not going to take off from time from Boston. <laughs> hanging out there, it's like all these young people. Like I'm so excited. I'm like, don't. You're going to have a whole new life here at the airport. Don't. <laughs> don't worry about it. <laughs> oh man. Yeah, it seems like this should be like a fixable thing. Like we have like radar and stuff like that. The pilot was so apologetic though. And he's very Californian too. He's like, hey, how's it going? This is, uh, this is your captain Steve. So uh, we're really psyched to go to California, but uh, just like a lot of fog there. So it's gonna be anywhere from five minutes to three hours. So just hang tight. And how much was it? It ended up being uh, two hours. Yeah, it's a good estimate. <laughs> and then they always say, uh, you know, well, good news is we're up in the air now. It's going to be a short six hours and 20 minutes. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I did, I did. Yeah, I, uh, I've had a lot of travel this semester, so basically I exist in no time zone now, which is great, you know. I'm just slightly tired all the time, but I'm never devastatingly tired, so that's good. How are you keeping up with the jet lag? Excuse me? How are you keeping up with jet lag? I mostly exercise. And then whenever I get in the time zone, I try to like do some running, like ahead of time, like yeah, in the sun. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't used to think that was true, but like it really, particularly that second day, man, do some exercise really helps to reset the clock. Hey. hey, good to see you. Good to see you. How's it going? That's fine. I won't interpret that as disgust at the talk. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks. It's good. Things are good. Yeah. Yeah, I, I almost wanted to use your approach that you used for uh, that Google networking summit. You came up there, you're like, I got a whole different talk, man. I decided in the airplane, I don't want to go with that old talk, you know? <laughs> So talking about politics or something. That's right. That's right. Oh man. All right, so we can get started. We are very happy to have Jim Smickens visit us from Harvard. He's a professor at Harvard. He was before at MSR. Um, so uh, James works in system security and apparently informal reasons for not wanting to use formal methods. <laughs> so James has done a lot of very impressive work in web security, performance and scaling. And he's also very well known for his wisdom, <laughs> which <laughs> it's something I cannot do justice to, so you'll have to read his articles online. I really encourage you. They're very, very interesting and entertaining. And uh, so, yes, we're very, very happy to have James come and tell us about shrinking the attack surface for expressive trusted hardware and to impart some of his wisdom on us. Thank you, James. Thanks. Can everyone hear me? Does the microphone work? All right, thumbs up. Excellent. So, yes, the rumors are true. I am, in fact, James. And today I'm going to talk to you about how we can use trusted hardware to run secure computations. So why am I interested uh, in this problem? Well, look at all those devices, right? Laptops, tablets, smartphones, desktops, all of those devices, unsurprisingly to this audience, I hope, are running software. Look at all that filthy software, right? Photoshop doesn't trust PowerPoint. PowerPoint doesn't trust Photoshop. And what if the user level applications don't actually trust the privileged software on that machine, like the operating system or the hypervisor, right? How could we isolate those types of user mode applications from that uh, privileged software? Questions like this are particularly relevant in the cloud, because look at all the filthy tenants, right? You've got code for multiple parties running on a single physical server, right? And those tenants don't actually trust each other. Furthermore, Look at all those filthy data center operators, right? The tenants don't necessarily trust people like Azure or uh, like Amazon to actually not tamper with the data that's running on the physical servers. So tenants would actually like to be able to uh, provide integrity not only with respect to uh, misbehaving tenant code, but also with respect to misbehaving a privileged code like a hypervisor run by the data center operator. So 
Looking back over all those examples, what are some possible goals that we might want to establish for secure computation? Well, one of those goals might be to isolate a secure computation from other local computations, right, including privileged ones, for example, that are run by the hypervisor. You might also want to protect a secure computation from attacks that, level, that leverage physical possession of the machine. So this is like you know, all your untrustworthy double E friends who have like voltameters or whatever it is they use, two paper clips, they stick it in the circuit, right? You might be worried about someone launching bus snooping attacks, right? Things like that. You might also want to be able to use uh, 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 trusted hardware to allow the demonstration of a code's integrity or its security for some definition of security, right? So you might want to allow uh, some machine that's running in a user's home to verify that a secure computation in the cloud actually has uh, these properties like integrity and isolation. And furthermore, we might want to achieve goals one through three with minimal performance overhead, right? And so uh, I will say that in the, in the context of this talk, we will actually not be trying to achieve these goals with like formal methods for crypto. So just ignore these foul rituals purely for the focus of this talk, right? Everyone out in the audience who's doing that stuff, I love you, America supports you, I will not be doing this kind of stuff. So here's an outline for the rest of the talk. So what I'm first gonna do is give you sort of like a, a quick overhead of current approaches for using trusted hardware to provide secure computation. Then I'm gonna discuss some of the new uh, research that I'm working on at Harvard. Uh, one of those uh, uh, techniques is called undervisors, right? You know, the key to all successful research is come up with a cool name, right? So uh, one of them is called undervisors. And then another one, right? Startup ready, on-demand security coprocessors. What could it mean? It's early research, you help me figure it out. All right, so let's start looking at these current approaches for using trusted hardware to create secure computations. It's all about trust, right? Particularly in cloud situations. And the scenario I'm gonna focus on today is a scenario in which we've got two machines here. And let's call one of them the attester and the other one the verifier. So you can imagine that the attester wants to send a summary of its software stack to the verifier. The verifier then wants to actually look at that summary and make some uh, adjudication about whether the attester software stack is trustworthy for some definition of trustworthy. And then if that verification succeeds, the verifier and the attester will then exchange sensitive information. Right? And you can imagine this scenario uh, taking place, for example, in cloud computing situations, where you don't want to upload sensitive information to the cloud unless you have some guarantee about the security of some remote machine. So TPM chips uh, are a very common way to achieve this goal. So the threat model here is that users are going to trust the remote server hardware. However, the users worry that the data center operator won't run trusted software. Okay, so this is gonna be a mechanism that's gonna use a hardware-based route of trust. So we assume that the server has some tamper-resistant uh, TPM hardware, trusted platform module hardware, that contains a couple things. It's gonna contain a public-private key pair, so that public key is gonna be certified by the manufacturer of the hardware. So for example, Intel might certify, like hear ye, hear ye, you can imagine Intel comes from the 17th century, hear ye, hear ye, this is the unique public key for this particular piece of trusted hardware. The trusted hardware is also gonna have a private key that never leaves the hardware. Okay, so that's very, very important. Uh, the TPM chip's also gonna have uh, these things called PCR registers, platform configuration registers. So at boot time, these PCRs are gonna be initialized as some well-known values. Okay, these are publicly known values. And each PCR, to a first approximation, can only be updated using this extend operation. So you pass in the index of the PCR register that you want to update, and then some value. And the semantics for this extend command are that we're going to set a particular PCR register to the hash of the current contents of that register concatenated with the new value. So this is called like a cumulative hash sometimes, right? So essentially we're creating sort of like a running hash value um, that will represent um, uh, something. Now, what in particular do we want that something to be? Well, we can actually use this to create a succinct summary of a software stack. So imagine that uh, you hit power on a server machine. The read-only firmware starts executing. The read-only firmware can then find that first level bootloader on a storage device and then call extend 
And let's say we're going to store the summary of the software stack in PCR register 10. So we're going to call extend, and then we're going to pass in, pass in a hash of that first level bootloader. Okay? So now we've sort of created a record of the fact that the first piece of software we loaded was this particular first level bootloader with a particular hash. So now you can imagine that the first level bootloader runs. It finds the second level bootloader on the storage device and then does another extend operation, this time extending PCR10 with the hash of the second level bootloader. Okay, so now we have a record of the second piece of software that we loaded. And this can happen recursively, right? So now the second level bootloader will extend the PCR value uh, with the hash of the operating system. You can do this with executable binaries, configuration files, so on and so forth. Okay? So these primitives allow uh, remote attestation. So what the attester can say, can say, knock, knock, hello, uh, how's it going, to the verifier. The verifier can then send back a nonce, in case it's a random number. And then the attester can send back a couple things. Can send back a list of the hashes for all of those components that were uh, passed in to the extend operation. It can send over a certificate for its public key, so once again, a certificate signed by Intel or AMD or whoever. And it can also send back a signed copy of the current value of PCR10 and then the nonce. The nonce is for freshness. Right? So what the, val uh, what the verifier can then do is, first of all, validate the signature to make sure that it's talking to a real copy of trusted hardware. Ensure that that PCR10 value, that cumulative hash, actually corresponds to the cumulative hash of the uh, claimed components up here. And then you can check a hash database to see whether the binaries uh, are actually trusted that we're attested to. So does that make sense? Does everyone see how that works? OK. So what are the deficiencies of the traditional approach towards remote attestation? So one problem is that the boot order for a machine is oftentimes non-deterministic. OK? So like this is just an example of this. So I just booted up my laptop twice. And I'm kind of looking at like the visual dip of things. And like the green sort of like glowing modules of energy basically show where there are differences, right? So this is not good, right? Because this means that either attestation is almost always going to fail, right? Because there's going to be the verifier looking for a single static order of things, or the verifier is going to have to be tolerant to certain orderings of different components loading with respect to other ones. And that can be problematic because sometimes security properties are dependent on the order in which things load. Yes? why you're choosing to study the TCM as opposed to the GX? Because in GX, the yeah. attestation does not have to attest the whole stack and does not have to attest the order, right? Yeah, we'll get to that in one moment. That's exactly right. So basically, I'm starting with TPMs here just because this is sort of like the first mechanism people thought about to do attestation. Um, it has some problems here, exactly right. We will then, uh, I will then pivot to SGX. I'll say what's good about it. I'll then beat it uh, up for a bit and then present myself as the savior who will uh, <laughs> prevent humanity from <laughs> slipping into a moral uh, decline. So non-deterministic boot orders are a problem. Um, also, attestation only captures the load time integrity of a file. So for example, it can't actually detect post-load uh, corruptions. Like think about like control flow violations or things like that. Regular attestation just says, here's the hash of this thing at the time that I loaded it. And so it's actually also difficult to reason about machine-specific configurations. Right? So imagine that you want to check for the integrity of a particular configuration file. Let's say that file has like a host name in it. Oh no, well its hash is going to be different for each single person. So how do you take advantage of that when you're looking at these hashes? And furthermore, TPMs in and of themselves don't actually provide isolation for secure computations. They only vouch for what happens at load time. So if we go back to those possible goals that we talked about for secure computation, well, do we think that TPMs isolate a secure computation from other ones? Well, here the answer is actually no. Right? We don't really get any sort of, like, for example, page table-based isolation uh, involving secure computations. Can we protect a secure computation from attacks that leverage physical possession of the machine? Like, kind of. Right? So you will see, for example, tamperings of on-disk files. Right? When you ex use uh, those uh, files to extend the PCR, you will detect that. But you don't really protect against things like, let's say, uh, memory bus snooping or things like this. Do you demonstrate to users that their computations are actually secure? Like, kind of. So once again, you're not actually showing any dynamic security properties are being uh, satisfied. However, I would say that we do this very efficiently, in part because we're not doing a lot. Right? So I would say we achieve that goal there. So as brought up uh, by Raluca, who is our local security oracle here, 
SGX, right? Now, for those of you who are not familiar with SGX, or really anything that Intel does, this picture is very instructive, <laughs> okay? So here is the simple way of doing things, and here is SGX. And so we're going to go into this realm, okay? So for those of you with uh, weak constitutions, now would be a good time to uh, cover your eyes. So I'm gonna give you a very brief overview of SGX, because I think it's important to understand motivationally um, how it works, to understand what I'm trying to do. So here's an overview of SGX. So um, here is what a 64-bit address space looks like um, on an x86 machine. Uh, basically, we've got um, the user level state down here. We've got the kernel level state up here. And you may not know, but uh, in current x86 processors, you can't actually use all addresses as valid. So as it turns out, there's actually an empty gap in the middle um, because not all the address bits are used. I think it's only like 47 or 48 are currently used. So where does a secure computation in SGX live? It's that enclave, in the, it's gonna live in the virtual address space uh, of a user mode uh, uh, computation. And if we look inside that enclave here, that's where our secure state's gonna be stored, it's also gonna have a stack, a heap, some data, some code, um, and an entry table that I'll talk about a little bit more uh, later. So as I mentioned, an untrusted host process has to embed an enclave. Now, when you're executing the code in the untrusted host process, it can't actually access the enclave pages using some uh, page table trickeration that we'll talk about later. So untrusted code has to explicitly jump to the secure computation, has to jump to the enclave using this eenter instruction. Now, what's interesting is that enclave code actually operates at ring three, at the unprivileged level. This is a bit counterintuitive, right? You might think that it would wanna run with very high privileges. Um, but the reason you want to have it um, do this, uh, among other things, is that um, you don't trust transition, you don't trust the operating system in this model. So you don't want to uh, uh, allow the operating system to be able to tamper with this state here. So the enclave code runs at ring three. However, it can access the entire user mode address space of this untrusted process there. And so because Enclave code does not run at ring three and because it cannot actually issue system calls, why is that? Because what would happen on a system call? The OS would have to save the context of the thing that invoked a system call. But we don't trust the operating system. Enclave doesn't trust the operating system, so we don't allow this to happen. So, so how does the Enclave issue I.O.? It has to rely on the untrusted host. So basically there has to be some shared memory region um, that the Enclave can, for example, put I.O. request into and then get the untrusted uh, host code to actually issue those system calls on behalf of it. And so the uh, enclave code returns to the untrusted host using this e-exit instruction. Okay, so let's imagine we've got your core here, you've got your uh, L1 through L3 caches, uh, our beloved CR3 register for the page table pointer, we've got TLDs. We're also gonna have in SGX a new bit called is enclave, basically saying is the CPU executing in enclave mode or not? And we've got our physical RAM. In between physical RAM and the caching hierarchy, we're gonna have a memory encryption engine, okay? And that engine is gonna allow us to divide physical RAM into normal system memory up here, and then what's known as an enclave page cache, or an EPC down there. So this memory encryption engine is essentially going to add uh, counters for rollback protection, max, and encryption to all of the writes that come out of that thing up here and try to go here. That's all done transparently. So Enclave code doesn't have to worry about that. And similarly, when Enclave code wants to read uh, information from this sensitive area here, the memory encryption engine is going to transparently decrypt that data, check for rollback, check for integrity, stuff like that. Once again, all transparent to the uh, Enclave. And so we have this Enclave page map uh, structure up here. And so this is an uh, SGX structure that's basically gonna contain one entry for each of the pages down here in this sensitive uh, memory region. Uh, and so that enclave page cache can only be modified by SGX instructions, which I'll go over very briefly in a second. And so each EPCM entry has uh, uh, metadata like, what is the virtual address of the, uh, of the page that is being uh, mapped by this particular physical uh, enclave uh, EPC page? Okay, so very quickly, we'll just go through the life cycle for uh, an enclave. So before you call eCreate, which is like this magical instruction which allows you to um, create uh, an SGX enclave, 
the initial code and data for the secure computation are sitting somewhere up in normal host memory in that untrusted host process. So then you call eCreate, um, and essentially what eCreate's gonna do is it's going to uh, take some metadata information about the enclave and copy it into some region in EPC. So uh, this abbreviation here, just think of this as uh, a special type of enclave page that contains metadata uh, about the enclave that you're trying to create. So you call this eAd instruction. eAd is where you uh, are basically copying code or data from the untrusted host down to um, a particular enclave page here. And so note that as we're calling these instructions, we're actually creating EPC imagery, okay? Because we're building up the metadata for this particular enclave. So what does this eExtend instruction do? Ah, it's actually helping us to create a cumulative hash, right? Because we want to be able to attest an SGX enclave. So after we add a page to the enclave, we want to actually take a cumulative hash because later on we want to be able to attest that cumulative hash. And so you can do this repeatedly, so now we're building up a bunch of different pages in the enclave, and then at some point, um, you're going to do an e add and e extend of a TCS page, a thread control structure, that basically just tells you what are the valid entry points for this particular enclave. And then eventually you call e init, and so now uh, the enclave is sort of finalized, you can't do any more e adds or anything like that. So how does memory access uh, work in on, uh, uh, when you're running code in SGX? Well, as it turns out, there's extra hardware in the memory controller that can make sure that EPC pages can only be accessed uh, by the appropriate enclave. And these checks are gonna rely on this EPCM here, which you can essentially think of as an inverted page table, right? So basically, we have a single entry for every EPC page in this map. And if you look at the glorious Intel documentation for this, you will see a variety of um, sort of North Korean style flowcharts that are very injurious to the soul. Um, this is basically saying, if a memory access is an enclave access, right, then we wanna say, uh, well, okay, is the physical address that we're trying to access in the EPC, that protected region? If the answer is yes, do the EPCM checks. Those checks are done in consultation with that, right, that metadata. And if those checks are successful, we allow the memory access. Otherwise, there's a problem, right? So we do not allow the code to actually access um, the memory. Okay, so that's like a five minute blitz on how uh, SGX works. And so now I'll give you like a two minute blitz on why it doesn't achieve the goals that I want. So as it turns out, SGX is vulnerable to hyper-threading side channels via uh, functional units, okay? So gaze, if you will, upon what I believe is the best PowerPoint diagram that's ever been made, okay? That's all core PowerPoint there. I'm available for consulting. So what are we looking at here? So what we're looking at is sort of like a simplified um, out of order pipeline. And what we see is that, you know, sort of uh, here we have two logical processors um, and then a single sort of shared set of functional units here. And this is where all the out of order goodness happens. And so what we see is that imagine that you had enclave code running on one logical processor and non-enclave code running on the other logical processor. Well, they're gonna share these functional units inside of here. Right? That's not good. Why is that not good? Because imagine that the non-enclave code wants to try to figure out which functional unit the enclave code is using. It can basically do timing measurements and see how long certain instructions take and then measure the contention here. Okay? So that's not good. And as it turns out, SGX is also vulnerable to cache-based side channel attacks. So uh, hope maybe you've heard of a Meltdown. This was like causing people to freak out over the past uh, two or three years. Uh, basically what Meltdown showed is that there are race conditions at the microarchitectural level between a memory value being uh, pulled into the cache and then computed on, and then the security checks that actually determine whether that memory access should have been allowed in the first place, okay? So that's not good, right? Because it could mean that a computation could, let's say, bring in a value from uh, kernel space, even though it's only user mode code, and then bring that into the cache and try to speculatively compute on that before the CPU realizes, oh, that was a bad idea. So as it turns out, an untrusted host has to embed an enclave uh, inside its own address space. So what that means is that the enclave, the secure computation, and the untrusted host actually share the same L1 cache. So the details, uh, I don't wanna get into too much detail here, but long story short, because they share that L1 cache, there's actually uh, cache access patterns that the untrusted host can measure 
to see what memory addresses the trusted enclave computation is executing. And that's not good because it might leak keys that involving like uh, encryption that the enclave is doing, so on and so forth. So if you're interested in this, so see the foreshadow paper. Okay, that's the name of the attack that people came up with um, to exploit this. So what is the summary of this uh, seven minute explanation of SGX? It's this basically. We've been living in this world for a very long time where basically all of our Intel friends are now suffering from uh, seasonal depression where season is defined as the entire year and people were very, very upset about the fact that like, well, these, particularly these technologies that were sold to us as being secure, uh, they have all these problems. So when we look at the sort of goals for secure computation I mentioned at the beginning of uh, the talk, you know, do we think that we can use SGX to isolate a secure computation from other local computations? I say kind of, right? Because we do have uh, these side channel problems that can leak information. So can we protect a secure computation from attacks that leverage physical possession of the machine? Here I'd say yes. I mean, I do think it's actually pretty neat that you can have that memory controller sort of uh, encrypt and roll back protect and integrity check all the reads and writes going from a secure computation to RAM. So I'll, I'll give Intel a check there. Can we demonstrate to users that their secure computations are actually secure? Here I'll say, eh, maybe, because of the side channel issues. And with respect to do we achieve these goals of minimal performance overhead, here I'll say yes, right? Because if you think about it, like Enclave code runs on the highly optimized microarchitecture that's used for regular code. Now, in fact, this is actually one of the reasons why you have to feel a little bit sympathetic for the Intel engineers, right? Because like roughly speaking, the story of SGX is that you know, the CEO popped out of a trash can and was like, hey, take this complex microarchitecture, make it secure, and then that person went back into the trash can. Um, so that's hard, right? But you do get good performance with FGX. Okay, so this was all sort of motivational and background materials to then sort of allow you to understand uh, where my new research directions are going, right? So first I'm gonna talk about this undervisor idea. So uh, the first public service announcement here is that this is a work in progress. So I'd be glad to chat with people about this, but I think it's most interesting, at least for me, when I hear people talk about like early stuff, as opposed to like stuff that's like already finished. So it is work in progress. Uh, public service announcement number two, man, I don't understand how the Caltrain works. Like this is supposed to be how the Caltrain works. Like there's like four zones, I think. This is how I experience the Caltrain. I always buy a ticket and there's like 18 zones in between where I want to go and where I currently am. So I just want to say this, I'm going bankrupt, California is killing me. All right, if anyone's gonna have a tutorial on how to write the Caltrain, please find me. Uh, I'm an adult and I'm struggling with this. Back to the research. So uh, what's the high level idea behind Undervisor? So the basic idea here is that we want to enforce dynamic security invariance. So think of things like let's say CFI, for example, on a running program uh, without interference from other uh, programs that are running on that machine. So imagine we've got a developer here and imagine that the developer wants to run some code on a data center machine. So in the undervisor model, the developer is going to uh, create her code as normal, but she's also gonna create a security monitor. So think of this as another piece of software which is uh, going to be designed to uh, inspect the state of the application and then look for uh, security. For definition of security, we can look into more later. So the developer is gonna upload both that application and the security monitor to this new type of trusted hardware here, such that the security monitor can actually introspect on the state of the developer application, free from tampering by the hypervisor or other tenant applications, okay? And so the software-defined security checks that are gonna be in that monitor, they're gonna run on a security coprocessor, which shares minimal state with that main processor. Why do we want it to share minimal state? Once again, we want to get rid of things like side channels and other uh, vectors for um, sort of tampering. So imagine that we have uh, what I call the top half microarchitectural state. By top half, just think of this as like, this is like the regular microarchitecture that you run applications on, okay? So you've got registers, you've got RAM, you've got uh, caches, so on and so forth. And so let's imagine that this is where we run uh, Nginx, whatever your normal application code would be. And then we're gonna have down here what we're tentatively calling the ghost world, because that's amazing. Uh, so down here in the ghost world, this is where we have the security coprocessor. It's got its own CPU, its own registers, and its own set of RAM, okay? And we don't expect there to be as much RAM, for example, down here in the ghost world as up here, because we expect our security checks to be much more simple than the arbitrary code run up there. So down here in the ghost world, we've got the monitor code, right? That was the thing that the developer uploaded alongside her regular application code. 
And so what can that Go CPU do? How is it linked to that top half set of microarchitectural resources? Well, the Go CPU can read the top half uh, instruction sequences and register values. So in other words, we allow this ghost uh, CPU here to introspect in a read-only way on the register state from the top half. We also allow that ghost CPU to stall the top half pipeline. So we have the moral equivalent of a little rope here, which the monitor code can pull to stall the pipeline. So why is that useful? Because it might be that, let's say we have a long-running security check. We don't want a top half instruction to retire before the associated security check has finished. We also uh, want to allow the uh, Ghost World CPU to be able to uh, basically uh, clear the top half pipeline because we might want to raise an exception. We might want to raise an exception because the security check might have been violated. Right? And as I'll show you in a second, we might also want to allow the CPU uh, down here to force a context switch from the top half um, a CPU. And I'll show you why that's useful in a second. And the final thing that we want to allow this ghost world microarchitecture to do is to blacklist uh, top half TLD entries. And this blacklisting will be very helpful for ensuring the, uh, the memory-based isolation of that top half application that we're trying to protect not only from other tenants, but also from the hypervisor as well. So what would the life cycle of a monitor program look like? So we'll have an initialization step first. Um, so first we're going to uh, inform uh, the ghost world down here of all of the top half applications memory pages. This is going to be somewhat similar to like SGX uh, eAd and eExtend uh, operations. And so we're going to blacklist all of those top half application pages on every other core's TLD. Because right? remember, we want to isolate that top half application like Nginx from all other code running on the top half uh, microarchitecture. So that's where the TLD blacklist become helpful. So next, we're going to copy the monitor's initial uh, code and data pages into the ghost RAM. Okay, so that's going to allow us to establish the monitor uh, state down here. So then in execution, what's going to happen is that the untrusted top half code is going to invoke some, uh, some new special instruction to basically say, hey, I now want to start uh, having myself be monitored. So the ghost, the ghost world is then going to do a couple of things. It's going to push some saved register state onto the top half pipeline. Think of this as being like the initial state for the secure computation that we want to run in the top half pipeline. We're then going to remove the TLD blacklist for the local core, right? Not for other cores, just for the local core. Because now we want the actual local core to be able to run this sensitive top half uh, code and access the sensitive data as well. And then the ghost world is going to restart the top half pipeline and now start monitoring. So what we have at this, uh, at this moment is that we have top half code, like Nginx, for example. It can run on the local core. And by meaning it can run, we've removed the TLD blacklist for that core. So it can access all the code and data pages involved with that top half application. Other top half cores cannot access the code or data for that monitored top half application because of the TLD blacklist. And uh, we now have the monitor code down here being able to see sort of a, a copy of the top half register state. Yeah? So how do you timeshare between different applications on the top? Do you um, have a blacklist per application or is really just per TLD blacklist? Oh, let's see. So like how, how would I, for example, time slice? Do multiple applications still share space? I guess that's something. Ah, okay. Know. So in our current envisioning of this, there's, there's no notion of, let's say, like uh, shared memory pages between like um, two different monitored applications. We're trying to figure out if it's a safe way to do that. Um, it's a little bit tricky because um, as I'll show you uh, in a couple slides, we're starting to look at what the microarchitecture down here will look like. And it, we're worried that it might complicate the memory hierarchy if we start doing that. It's, it's a good question. So do they share the caches, different applications? Will they share the caches? Uh, let's see here. So they, if I understand your question correctly, they should not. Right, they should not because that would be a side channel. Yeah, exactly. That's correct. That's correct. And so let's say that we have uh, a yield of that monitor top half application uh, because it explic explicitly calls yield, or maybe it wants to, uh, it has to handle an external interrupt. So here, what the Go CPU has to do is that it basically has to take that top half register state 
and dump it to internal ghost RAM. So it's like basically saving that secure execution context. And then it's going to clear out. It's going to zap the top half pipeline. We don't want to leave any like secret information living up there. And then it can actually raise a top half interrupt to allow the untrusted uh, top half OS to run. Right? And this is safe because we've actually uh, sort of blasted out all the sensitive register state um, from that application. And we've also, uh, we have to change the TLB entries as well. We have to add that TLB blacklist back to the local core so that that uh, top half untrusted system software can't poke at sensitive state. So what do we get here? So we get no co-tenancy of uh, ghost code and top half code on the same physical core or logical core. That's important to remove opportunities for side channels and things like this. So in particular, there's not going to be any side channels via shared functional units. And we're going to drill down on the microarchitecture in a second, which will make this more clear. And there's also no reliance on the untrusted OS to schedule that monitor code, to schedule that ghost code, right? Because basically, once the uh, top half code executes that special instruction to say, hey, monitor me, then the microarchitecture takes over and automatically starts running the monitor. Now, the untrusted OS does have to initially kick off the top half code, right? There's still denial of service attacks here that can take place via that mechanism. But we've guaranteed that if the untrusted OS does ever schedule that top half application code, then if that code can in, uh, invoke the special instruction to kick off monitor mode, then we will always have the monitor code running. Uh, yeah? So uh, you can't understand. So presumably, you want to run multiple applica applications in the system, right, at the same time. And so if they share nothing, if they don't share cache, if they don't share anything, then you'll take a huge performance hit, right? Well, so you'll end up taking a huge performance hit. Well, you'll take the performance hit for the applications that want to be monitored in this way, mm -hmm. right? So we're not actually disabling, uh, let's say, L1 through L3 for everything, mm -hmm. right? I see. But like the, and like this is actually one of the things that we're trying to get feedback on, right? So we sort of started this project from a very like ideological perspective in a certain sense. We're saying, okay, let's see how far we can push this isolation. And I think subsequent uh, diagrams might make that a little bit clearer. But you're right that whenever you do, and like, you know, we're not the first person, uh, first people to observe that, like, if you get rid of, like, caching in, in general or always flush the cache, you get rid of side channels. Yeah, there's so a tension yeah, there. Yeah, basically, you're a single tenant, right? In the secure world, it's a single tenant. It's not multi tenant. Uh, yeah, so for ex that's right. So, for example, like, if this were, um, that's right. In the top half world, there's just going to be one application. That's right. So yes, as we've been discussing, there's no sharing of caches um, or other memory hierarchy stuff, which gets rid of side channels via the L star hierarchy. Um, one thing that is very nice about this, though, is that if you don't try to get the uh, bottom half microarchitecture involved in the top half memory hierarchy, that really simplifies the design of the bottom half hardware. Because the memory hierarchy is actually very complicated. Um, there's a lot of non-determinism there. Um, there's a lot of sort of crazy things to think about. Yes, you either do that or, or yeah, or that's right. Or you could try to do things like have like um, I think Intel has like some like CAT like cache allocation technology or something, where basically you can like uh, reserve partitions of the cache. Oh, right. That's another option. So we haven't actually explored that in great detail right. now. So it, would it, have the performance it would. It would. Yeah. The the stuff we focused on the most. Um, we can go to. Uh, this now is that we've been thinking about, okay, ignoring some of the cache stuff, we want to look at some of like, like what do the wires look like that connect, for example, top half register state to like the bottom half CPU? That's mainly what we've been focusing on right now, right? Because we think that's sort of like the core in terms of like providing security goals. Now for performance, the cache stuff becomes very important. We'll come back to that in a second. Okay, so that's sort of like the high level idea behind this stuff. So we thought to ourselves, okay, cool, so let's, let's try to build this. But uh, as we all know with IKEA furniture, this is uh, easier said than done. Right? In particular, because when you start looking at the microarchitectural implications of this design, there's actually some subtlety. So let's go back to um, this sort of uh, pipeline, the top half pipeline that I showed you before. And now let's actually think about what kind of wires would actually connect the uh, top half uh, to the bottom half. So down here, I've represented the uh, bottom half CPU as kind of like your, your sort of simple, like five stage, like MIPS style type thing. Um, so uh, this is broke, I should say, RISC-V type thing. Uh, so you know, we have sort of like the fetch, decode, execute, so on and so forth. So uh, one thing we'll have is we'll have sort of like a wire going from the program counter up here 
uh, to the fetch stage down here. So why do we have that wire there? So basically, uh, we're thinking that the programming model is going to be that developers are going to structure their monitor as sort of like a table that's going to map top half PC values to instruction sequences to monitor code that's going to execute in the bottom half when a particular security check needs to run. So in other words, when the top half PC hits a certain value, um, we're always looking at that PC value, and if it's a certain um, uh, target value, we then start fetching monitor code um, from the bottom half ramp. Yeah? Yeah, so I guess I'm trying to understand why you would have a general purpose processor doing this. Like, what do the monitor rules look like that you're trying to enforce? Right, so we're... Right, the reason is because we want to allow arbitrary definitions of security monitors. So, so uh, some people, for example, have looked at a scenario where it's like, assume you only wanted to enforce control flow integrity. Right, if you only wanted to do that, then as it turns out, you can make fairly specialized hardware that can make those decisions very, very quickly. Um, but we're trying to allow this to be more generic than that. Uh, yeah, so whenever you have a hit in this table, then you basically wake up the uh, Ghost World CPU and you start feeding in monitor instructions. And so we're also going to have um, some wires that come from a couple different places in the top half. So uh, the place where we uh, fetch top half instructions, the place where we do register reads, and the place where we do register writes. So why is this uh, helpful? Well, because we want the Ghost World monitor code, like basically what are its inputs? Its inputs are top half state. And like literally, what does that mean? Well, as I mentioned, we, want to, we don't want to entangle the bottom half uh, core in uh, the memory hierarchy. So basically, all of our uh, security checks have to be expressible as register, like computations over top half register state. So these wires that we see coming down here, that first one is going to give us, uh, give the Ghost World CPU access to the instruction stream from the top half. This wire here, after the register read stage, is going to give the Ghost World access to the input registers. And then this wire here is going to give us access to the written registers. And so like an example of an instruction that might execute in uh, the Ghost World CPU, like you might want to do a comparison instruction between the value of some top half register associated with some particular top half PC. Right? So think of like every instruction in the top half as being associated kind of like with a snapshot of like here's what its input register values were and here's what its output register values were. So that's kind of like what this syntax here means. Because if you think about it, like the, the value of some top half register is going to change over time. So the monitor wants to sort of be able to say it's this particular time stamped version of the register I want to look at. And then you might also have some bottom half registers here that you want to involve um, in a monitor check. And so another thing that we'll have is a wire coming from the retire stage here up to um, so the retire stage of the top half uh, CPU. And we'll also have a wire coming from the retire stage here up to the store buffers, the things that are going to actually buffer writes until they're ready to emit to the memory hierarchy. So why do we have these things? Well, basically, we want to allow the bottom half uh, monitor code to be able to stall uh, top half instruction streams until the relevant security checks have completed. Okay, so this is basically allowing the uh, Ghost World CPU to prevent uh, an instruction from the top half from retiring until the relevant security check is run. So just to make this more concrete, um, let's imagine we had the following top half code. This is basically just top half code to invoke a system call. Okay, so we just move some values into registers um, and then invoke the syscall instruction. And then imagine that the monitor code down here, the policy, which is kind of like a goofy one, but just wants to ensure that um, uh, if you do a write system call, that you have uh, the file descriptor being one. Okay, so we're essentially just going to uh, compare the value of RDI uh, at the time that the uh, syscall instruction is invoked. That value should be equal to one, and we want to fail. We want to raise a security exception if the value is not, in fact, one. So. Here's what it might look like. So remember that a monitor code is triggered by a particular top half PC value being hit. In this case, uh, the monitor code is triggered when the syscalls a PC value is hit. So this is what the top half pipeline looks like at that moment. And then this is what the bottom half pipeline is going to look like. So this is the first instruction in the monitor code. 
then we're going to see things move through the pipeline. Hours of work on that animation, respect that. Yeah, moves through again. Very exciting, right? So now we're going to have a bit of a problem, right? Because if we look here, this thing's actually going to stall, right? Because the value of RDI that we're looking for hasn't actually been written by the top half yet. So just to make that more clear, if you look in the bottom uh, left, you'll see that we're doing a comparison instruction which wants to read the value of RDI at the time that um, that, that syscall instruction uh, is going to be called. If we look in the upper left, where does RDI, how does it get set? It gets set from a memory read, right? But if we look at where the associated move instruction is in the top half pipeline, it's here in the execute stage. We haven't gotten to the memory stage yet. So basically, we have to wait, injecting kind of a bubble in the bottom half uh, pipeline. We have to wait till the move in the top half gets to um, the point where it's actually received the value of RDI, and then we can sort of forward that value down to the bottom half pipeline. So now we see instructions continuing to retire as before, go on, so forth and so forth, and eventually we're going to get to the stage where the uh, system call instruction is ready to retire. Now at this point, that bottom half piece of monitor code kind of knows what all the values are. It can actually determine that yes, we should allow that instruction to actually uh, complete. So does that example make sense? OK. So uh, what are some of the open research challenges here? So uh, one challenge is programmability, right? So in particular, um, what should that ghost world um, ISA look like? I kind of showed you like this quasi-goofy like C++ style like scope resolution operator. Like, that was literally the first thing we thought of. There may be better ways to express these sort of dependency semantics. Also, I think there's some interesting PL challenges here, right? Because it would be kind of interesting if you could uh, create a PL framework such that you as the developer could actually co-design in the same, let's say, source code file, your regular application code, and then like the security checks that you want the monitor code to run. There's also some challenges at the microarchitecture level as well. So how do we design these wires that are coming you know, down and up such that we minimize stalls, such that we minimize the additional die area too, right? Because like the most naive way to implement, for example, the bottom half CPU is to literally just like plunk a full-blown, out of order, super powerful CPU down there, right? That's gonna be tears on the pillow with respect to die area. So hopefully there's something more um, efficient we can do there. And also it's not quite clear what the provisioning rule should be for bottom half uh, state. Like how much RAM do we actually need? Do we want to provide the developers? Um, how many functional units do we want to provide? Um, so on and so forth. So I should also say that I want to uh, give a special shout out to Berkeley because we are actually uh, using uh, some tools that were developed here uh, to prototype some of this stuff. So we're using some of the chisel stuff and we're using some of the other tools that have come out of here. So um, don't be trying to sneak on his last offer for the paper. I know you grad students are hungry. But, uh, but yeah, we thank you. So this stuff has been actually um, very, very helpful. Uh, so in uh, the last minute or two, I will just briefly uh, discuss another crazy idea that we had, which is to basically um, create security pro uh, processors on demand. So the basic idea here is that FPGAs, right? So FPGAs are pretty neat. FPGAs are programmable uh, hardware. Uh, and uh, if you're not aware of how FPGAs work, they're actually like perhaps not as magical as they might seem. So you've got these things called uh, basic logical blocks that implement a simple Boolean function. So like in this example, imagine that you want to implement a Boolean function over four input bits up there. Then what you can basically do is implement this thing called a lookup table. So as it turns out, you can implement a lookup table uh, that is going to compute a k-bit Boolean function. Uh, using two to the k configuration bits here. So like these, these pink things here might be an SRAM, might be like flash or something like this. And you can think of these things, these are multiplexers. So like whatever's coming in here is determining which of the two input bits you spit out. So you've got your basic uh, logic blocks, you've got your hard blocks, those are things like non-customizable logic. So DSP or maybe do some like uh, TCP checksum offloading, stuff like that. And then routing blocks, which basically just connect other types of blocks together. And you have these I.O. blocks that kind of sit on the outside to give you a setup like this. So like this is kind of a high level view of what an FPGA looks like. So you've got like a few of these basic logic blocks here connected by this ocean of routing blocks, right? And then at the edges, you have these I.O. blocks to allow like normal hardware to talk to it, 
right? So how do you like program one of these things? You can basically set those configuration bits that I showed you like on that lookup table, and then you kind of like change how the routing stuff works, right? And this, at least when I learned, this kind of blew my mind, because like whenever people would tell me like how FPGAs is just like this magic technology, but when you look at it, like you can understand perhaps why most FPGA technologies, they're mostly routing infrastructure, <laughs> right? Like that's how you enable this configurability. Anyway, so why do I bring this up? Well, it's interesting to think about, could we use an FPGA to implement ghost world security checks, right? So imagine if here is like this uh, top half processor that I was showing you, and then we have a new stage called a security stage at the end. Now, of course, this is like very facile, right? Just add a security module, right? Of course, this would seem to solve all problems, right? But this is actually interesting because like if we can get this to be fast, then maybe this could be faster than this sort of uh, more generic implementation that I've described, which assumes sort of like a generic sort of like processor at the bottom. So what are the security challenges involved in this uh, particular approach? Well, actually, when would an FPGA actually improve performance? So as you may know, clock speeds for FPGAs are typically slower than that of like a regular uh, real pipeline. So it's not clear when this would actually help. And also note that in this particular approach here, we're actually losing some opportunities for parallelism. Right, because when you have a separate top half and bottom half CPU, you can imagine the top half code executes in parallel, at least partially, with this monitor code. Here, it's like, well, it's just another pipeline stage. So that's a bit of a bummer. And it's also interesting to think about what kind of hard blocks baked in logic would be useful for this type of system. So hashing might be a thing you might care about. Um, maybe you want a hard block that just executes, uh, just uh, interacts with RAM. Lookup tables that somehow use bits of the instructions as keys to look up like instruction specific security policies. Um, maybe hardware structures for manipulating graphs. It's like a lot of security checks, so let's say CFI, are basically graph manipulation problems. There's also an interesting question of how or whether we should at all actually context switch the monitor code, that is to say the FPGA um, uh, design that we have here in the security stage. So why is that interesting? Well, it's interesting because the reconfiguration costs for FPGAs are not trivial, right? So they're gonna take like on the order of like hundreds of milliseconds to reconfigure. So it's not like we can actually be swapping in different security modules here on the order of uh, once every context switch. And then finally, what program language uh, tricks or what tooling support will we need to make it easy to program that security stage? So in summary, uh, remember to be kind. That's all I like to leave people with the positive message, but also trust nobody, particularly birds. Uh, birds are scandalous, right? I used to live in uh, Seattle, and I have lost countless french fries to birds that would just swoop when I'm talking to a friend. So trust nobody, except for the vendors of trusted hardware, because a complicated manufacturing process with a lengthy supply chain couldn't possibly be exploitable. So for the purposes of this talk, we don't trust the hardware vendors. So what would we talk about today? So we talked about how can we run secure computations using uh, trusted hardware. So I kind of gave you an overview first of a couple prior approaches. So TPMs, they don't provide strong isolation between trusted and untrusted code. They also don't provide any notion of dynamic security guarantees. They don't talk about what's happening to the state of uh, live running execution. I then talked about SGX. So SGX um, basically does provide some stronger isolation but it does actually involve co-tenancy of microarchitectural resources between trusted and untrusted code. And there are also no um, dynamic checks of live state in the sense of, you know, there's no checks on um, uh, type integrity for a managed code language or CFI or things like that. So I introduced uh, a new research uh, proposal that we're looking at called Undervisor. It basically provides strong isolation at the microarchitectural level um, we basically uh, run the security checks over dynamic state uh, in parallel with the application level code that's being monitored. Um, I discussed some of the research challenges. Uh, one of the big challenges that I didn't really spend a lot of time talking about is, you know, what types of security checks are actually expressible using pure reasoning over register state and not arbitrary memory values, right? Because we don't want to get the bottom half CPU entangled in the memory hierarchy of the top half CPU. But as a result, that means that all of our security checks have to operate over just top half register values. Now, those register values may have, in fact, been pulled from memory, or they may represent things that are about to be written to memory, but we don't actually want the bottom half CPU to be able to arbitrarily issue accesses to top half memory. So otherwise, there are side channels there, complicates the design of uh, the hardware down there. Uh, but yeah, with that, uh, thank you for the invite, uh, and I'd be glad to take any questions if we have time.
Questions? Yeah, that's right. So the model is that, like, let's say that we're both independent developers, and so you know, you upload your application, and maybe you particularly care about control flow integrity. Yeah, but much like in SGX, um, you know, you have to. So, so, so it's like in SGX, for example. Um, there is no sort of top half, bottom half distinction, yeah. but there is a distinction between like context switching, you know, into and out of different enclaves, right? And so we would have that same distinction here, whereby you can context switch into or out of a particular monitor top half application. The sort of a key difference with us is that when you context switch to a different monitor top half application, that sort of automatically um, installs the associated bottom half monitor code. Uh, let's see. So you do. So so uh, the bottom half does have to be aware of when context switches would happen at the uh, in the top half. For example, due to like exceptions. For example, right. So let's say like an interrupt comes in. So um, the bottom half has to be aware of when that interrupt comes in, so that if there was um, monitor code running in the top half, we can sort of like uh, save away its register state. We can reinstall the relevant TLB blacklist entries, and then vector control back to the uh, potentially untrusted top half OS. This is very similar to what happens with SGX, whereby you have to have like these asynchronous exit mechanisms. For example, when you're running enclave code, and let's say a timer interrupt comes in, you have to do a, a similar type of dance. That's right, but yeah, but there, but there, but there's there's uh, enough bookkeeping to do that. Similar to how like SGX knows, for example, like um, uh, how to change like memory mapping sort of metadata when you context switch into a particular uh, enclave. So you wipe out the old state before you context switch, like caches, branch predictors, everything. Uh, let's see. So on the top half, yeah, you have to do that unless you have like partitioning. Uh, sure. support. For so that's actually of side channels. Yeah, so that's actually one thing we're kind of looking at sort of on the side. But yeah, absent that, you have to sort of wipe that stuff out. Now that wiping out only takes place when you're doing context which is involving these monitor applications. If your uh, CPU is only running non-monitored code, then you get to enjoy all the regular cache and support and so on that you get. And another thing is the ghost world is still uh, is also untrusted except for the monitor, right? Uh, let's see. So the go we, we trust the ghost world to do certain things like properly handle what happens when timer interrupts come in. I mean, but all that stuff's going to be implemented in hardware, which in likelihood would be like sort of like microcode sort of at the ghost world level. But it is trusted to do context switches correctly. And that's important, right? In part because some of the attacks that he was mentioning. So you want to make sure, for example, that let's say that interrupt comes in, that the ghost world properly copies the register state to the monitored application and then zeroes it out. So there's no remnants left over. So we do trust the ghost world hardware to do that. That's good. Because the ghost world can also um, glean side channels, even if it's encrypted through some hardware mechanism, can still see which parts of memory changed, which didn't change, which registers changed, what, which TLB entries were set or not. So it could still do side channels. So it's important to trust it. Yep, that's right. Any other question? Yeah, so, so that's a great question. So I think that for many types of security checks, you can have the compiler emit it. So um, like for example, like CFI is always a great example because it typically tend, people like CFI and it tends to uh, point out some corner cases. So CFI is an interesting case where the compiler, depending on your language, right, your high level language, should know what the CFG is you know, at compile time. So you can imagine that sort of as a byproduct of like emitting the top half code, you emit the, um, the, the, the monitor code. You could also imagine too, if your top half language is like a monitored language, and let's say you care about type safety, 
right? So you don't want to uh, allow like type confusion attacks or stuff like that. The compiler should know what that stuff is, right? So you can imagine that being spit out as well. Um, you can imagine for more, uh, for lack of a better term, like uh, uh, security guarantees at a higher level of semantics where it's not directly exposed through a type system or something like that, you might want the developer to explicitly have to write um, those checks. But yeah, we think for many of them, you can have them written automatically. Any other question? All right, let's thank James one more time. Thank you.